morning, BRAIN members and guests. My name is Jasmine Johnson, coordinator for BRAIN. In observance of Juneteenth, we canceled today's convening for the general membership. However, our guest speakers agreed to join us to record a Q&A session on collaborative funding. The questions have been assigned, but we welcome all three of you to share additional answers to all the questions. Brain members and guests, we welcome your questions too. You can send them to me via email after this session is recorded and sent out to you via email. At the end of the convening, their contact information will be provided. So if you want to contact them and ask them additional questions, we welcome that as well. Michael, Jan, and Edie, we appreciate you all for being here and are going to get started. Before we start with introductions, our co-chair of the convening working group, Cindy Bonin, will affirm the organization. Good morning, I am Cindy Bona, and BRAIN is a network for youth organizations that provide one or more of the following, after school youth programming, summer youth programs, and or wrap around support services for youth. We have two goals, uh, build the youth service field to improve how communities and schools work together to create more equitable outcomes for youth in the long term and increase youth engagement in high quality out of school opportunities. We also have three principles of practice. So community, if you wanna go fast, go alone. If you want to go far, go together, Nelson Mandela. The quality of our relationships and trust matter. Move at the speed of trust. Collaboration, we can fight for the scraps that fall off the table or we can build a bigger table together. Collaboration builds the bigger table. Consensus. This process requires us to slow down, take time to build shared understanding and value equity in decision making. Thank you, Cindy, for affirming the organization. And we'll just start with Michael with his introduction. Thank you for being here, Michael. Sure, happy to be here. Michael Tipton, I'm president of the Blue Cross and Blue Shield of Louisiana Foundation. I also head up community relations for Blue Cross Blue Shield of Louisiana, the company. Um, by way of background, the company is uh, the state's oldest and largest health insurer. Um, our corporate side, we do volunteering, sponsorships, uh, engagement, as, as many businesses do, although we aim uh, to do that in ways that I think are deeply engaging of our people and, and our organization. On the foundation side, we're about a 30-year-old grant-making foundation. Uh, we are endowed, and so we give out in a normal year, three and a half, four million dollars in grants focused on public health across the state of Louisiana. Um, the last couple of years clearly have not been normal, and so we've been very active uh, during COVID-19 and hurricanes. Uh, we've given out about fifteen million dollars in disaster relief grants, on top of additional uh, public health focused grants. So about twenty-three million over the last two years. Uh, we're a fifty million dollar foundation, so we've spent about half. Um, of our resources in the last two years trying to address uh, the needs of our state uh, and certainly have played uh, a role in doing so with a lot of the, the partners who are here on the call. So that's broadly what we do. I can certainly speak about our other programs for folks who have questions, but that's who we are. Thank you, Michael. Well, Jasmine, if you'd like, I'll go next. Yes. Um, and I'm Jan Ross. I'm with uh, the Huey and Angelina Wilson Foundation. Uh, the Wilson Foundation has actually been around since the mid-1980s, um, but it wasn't until the fall of 2000 that we started formal grant making. Um, and since that time, we have invested over $68 million in the greater Baton Rouge area. And that really has been um, reactionary uh, grant making with a focus on uh, human services, which is about 45% of our giving but also in education, healthcare, and prison reentry programs. And as we go forward, that will change. We'll be um, investing about $7 million in the community each year. Um, and with our new strategic plan, that will have a focus uh, in the implementation schedule of our strategic plan, which we're just kicking off 
is this summer we'll start with a um, capacity building uh, program, which is focused on building the capacity in all areas of nonprofit work, uh, operations, governance, um, just all areas of nonprofit work. Um, and that will be organizations that serve the greater Baton Rouge area. Uh, then in the fall, we'll start a people focused, which is a focus geographically um, in the greater Baton Rouge area, but the people will be um, those in poverty, those uh, that fit in the Alice um, category, and then also those that are formerly incarcerated prison reentry type programs. And then next year, we will have a focus um, where a sizable amount of our giving will be focused in the North Baton Rouge area. And that will follow um, a, um, implement, implementing our focus, following something called place-based community uh, focus. And um, it will focus on education, healthcare, um, and also community wellness. And this will be very specifically focused on um, a small handful of, um, of neighborhoods that are um, that have the demographics that have the statistics that back up um, the the worst of crime, the worst of education, the worst of healthcare access, um, you know, just all of the social ills. And we continue to do the research on where that particular area is going to be, but we'll be announcing that in 2023. Um, and let me stress that um, though we will have a significant amount of money that goes to the North Baton Rouge area, we will continue to have our focus on the greater Baton Rouge area. So do recognize that uh, we're not totally focused on North Baton Rouge. And then last but not least, I will um, inform you that uh, Friday, August 26th is our next um, grant cycle deadline. And that is what we call our traditional grant making um, because we do continue to do our traditional grant making as we begin the implementation of our strategic plan. So though, though things are changing, we still have time to do our traditional grant making, which you'll find all of our applications and uh, helpful hints and, uh, and tools on our website if you'd like to check that out there. And as always, if you have questions, please don't hesitate to reach out. I will put my contact information in the chat box. So Edie, would you like to introduce yourself? Yes, thank you, Dan. Hi, everyone. I'm Edie Addison with Capital Area United Way. Um, I'm the VP of Community Impact. So I'm on the team that oversees grant making as well as direct service initiatives in the community. Uh, Capital Area United Way has been around for almost 100 years. We're gearing up to celebrate our centennial in 2025, which is very exciting um, and definitely celebrating the many years of progress um, along the way. So we are, um, as I mentioned, a grant maker, but also um, running our own direct service initiatives. We also focus on the Alice population. It's asset limited, income constrained, employed, uh, the populations that have typically been known as the working poor and below. Um, and specifically, we work in four focus areas, health, income stability, basic needs, and education. Um, and within those four focus areas, we do a few different things. We have long-term programmatic grants that are typically for three years. Um, and then in the past several years, um, we've really changed up the way that traditional United Ways have operated. And we've introduced competitive um, programmatic grants, project grants. Um, and then just as Wilson and Blue Cross have done in the, in the past couple of years as well, we've been very reactionary to disasters. Um, so on a typical year, we're granting out between three and five million dollars, either through um, competitive grants um, or invitation only grants, as well as our own direct service initiatives. Um, so we are, like many of your organizations, also competing for dollars. Um, we have programs like the Volunteer Income Tax Assistance Program that's providing free tax preparation. We have our two-on-one information, referral, and crisis services. Um, and so we are on the, um, you know, the, the giving end of grants, but we're also on the receiving end um, for those initiatives that we need to fundraise as well. So 
it gives us a little bit of a, a different perspective as a grant maker. Um, and yeah, I, I think that's it. Turn it over to you, Jasmine. Thank you, Edie, um, for that introduction. Um, so as we said today, uh, you, you have all given us like an overview of um, what your organizations do. Today, we want to talk about um, collaborative funding and how that would benefit our members. Um, so we put together a Q&A and uh, we would like to get your feedback. Um, it's important that the organizations understand some base terms. So we'll start with um, asking Jan, what is collaborative funding by definition? So collaborative funding is um, <clears throat> really on the funder side, but there is a way um, for the nonprofit to understand um, how it fits with their organizations and what they can, how they can use uh, collaborative funding. So collaborative, collaborative funding is, like I said, on the funder side, and it's really um, bringing funders together um, where they can learn and they can share information. Um, but it also can be aligning their, um, their focus, aligning their funding, um, towards a very particular focus. Um, each collaborative is very unique. Um, it may be for um, information sharing, but it may be for funding sharing, just as a collaboration within um, of nonprofits. Um, so it's very important to, to recognize that. But where does that, um, or how does that impact the nonprofits. Um, a funding collaborative on the nonprofit side could be something that they put together or they, um, they are a part of. And some examples of that, and in, in, uh, let me state um, broadly that it is a matter of how do you leverage your resources? How does a funder leverage their resources um, on a, in order to have a greater impact on a particular area? And the same thing is with nonprofits. How do they leverage their resources, which could be financial, but it could be their staff. It could be other types of resources that they have available to them. Um, so one way is through pooled or what you might um, I hear the, the more recently of the term braided funding, um, where an organization may have access to different types of funding, whether it be through government grants or through donations. Um, and, and it might be in-kind donations, but it is pooling all of the resources available in order to be able to support the issue, the program, whatever that might be. And as we know, gov many government grants um, require some kind of local match to it. And so that's where your um, you know, foundation grants or individual donations come in. That's where your own in-kind um, uh, you know, resources come in. And that's what, what I, I'm describing as in-kind resources might be that staffing or resources from, uh, from the greater organization that can be applied to a particular program. Um, also, challenge grants can be used in this way to braid or collaborate uh, funders together. Um, and it is working with a donor that is, um, that is providing you a challenge where the organization goes out into the community. And that collaboration is finding donors that will help you provide that match to the challenge grant from your, uh, from your funder. Um, but there's also like public private partnerships where an organization might be a part of a collaborative 
uh, entity, and I'll say entity, but uh, activity to where maybe it's government entity, maybe it's uh, uh, the Metro Council um, funding that's available or program that is available through the mayor's office, um, that maybe there's a corporate donation that is included in this partnership. And then there's also nonprofits that are a part of that um, of that partnership. Um, and so that, that would create that public-private partnership. So I just wanted to give examples of how collaborative funding is used from the different, um, different levels, and I'll, I'll say funders as well as nonprofits, but how it can be used and, and how creative you can be with it. And it really is a matter of communicating with those that you're in partnership with, whether it be a funder or other um, organizations or entities that you're working with out in the community. Um, and Jasmine, in, um, in looking at our agenda, one of the things that we wanted to talk about was what is the collaborative funding as compared to what are collaborative partnerships. And so I think that you will see that there's a lot of um, similarities there. And I, I hope that you'll hear, you know, that you'll be uh, attentive to the terms that I was using in as you hear about the definition of what co collaborative partnerships might look like. Jan, you are absolutely right. And we do want to hear about those similarities and um, you know, also define them. So Edie, if you can take that question and share with us um, by definition what a collaborative partnership is and also share examples and um, you know, compare and uh, we would appreciate that. Sure, I just wanna make sure I'm not stealing Michael's question if he's prepared to answer that one. <laughs> I am so sorry. It is Michael. I apologize, Michael. You're welcome to take it if you want, Edie. We can, uh, no, Michael, that's yours. <laughs> fair enough. Uh, so by definition, a collaborative partnership. I, I mean, first thing I would say is uh, the nonprofit world, the funding world has a heck of a lot of lingo. Uh, and we use different things to mean slightly different things. The basic point of a collaborative partnership is it, are you or is your organization working with another person or another organization to achieve a shared desired outcome? Um, that can be increasing efficiency on the back end of your organization. That can be increasing reach. That can be increasing impact. Uh, there is certainly, to Jan's point, ways in which funding gets intertwined into that, uh, where you can bring different funders together that only fund in a certain lane. Um, but as I often say to our grantees, everything connects to everything else. Uh, the world of public health connects to education, connects to infrastructure, even though there are separate entities that only fund housing or education or whatever the case may be. So fundamentally, a collaborative partnership is about bringing together organizations or people that can uh, work together in a collaborative or, or uh, convening kind of way to achieve a shared outcome. The most common of these that people talk about in the philanthropic world is what people call collective impact, uh, which is its own sort of model. Uh, I will say I'm moderately suspect uh, of the that concept because in a lot of ways, uh, you know, convening needs to be and collaborative partnerships need to be driven by organizations' desires and interests. Uh, and frequently, uh, collaborative partnerships are sort of forced together. Um, you know, either there's sort of a carrot or a stick of funding, or you have to work together kind of thing. You know, my experience from seeing this work is the best collaborative partnerships are where one organization looks at another and says, you know, you all do something that we could learn from. How can we learn from that work thoughtfully and well? How can we align our services thoughtfully and well to do a better job of what we do and what you do? Uh, I think that's the best version of it. But obviously, you know, like all things in the nonprofit world, there's lots of different flavors and nuances uh, along the spectrum. Thank you. Did, um, Edie or Jan, did you all want to add to what Michael has said? Did y'all have any additional comments? I think that was a great definition, Michael. Yeah, definitely, definitely. 
Well, um, Edie, yes. Um, we'd like to know if organizations um, with established collaborative partnerships are interested in enhancing and strengthening their relationship by applying for funding together, because we know some partnerships, you know, want to take it to the next step. What, what would you say those action steps should be? Sure. Um, so I would say number one is don't jump right into it. I think it's really important that organizations are operating their own services really well and for a, a good period of time before they jump into a collaborative funding relationship with another organization. Um, I think once you're, you have a good handle on what your lane is and what the gaps are that your organization is trying to fill, whether it's, you know, a gap in service, a gap in um, some type of, you know, back-end management that Michael mentioned, or a gap in training or expertise. Once you're figuring out who those partners are and you're in those relationships where your, your needs are being met and that collaborative partner's needs are being met, I think then you're ready to start exploring those relationships. Um, I think it's really, really important that these organizations set clear boundaries with one another. Um, typically that's done through some type of contract, um, a memorandum of understanding or agreement. Um, putting your partnership on paper just gives you guidelines to stay within when something goes wrong. Um, I think it's also really important to plan for things to go wrong. <laughs> plan for the scenarios in which you're having a communication difficulty. Um, there's some type of decision that needs to be made. Um, what's going to be your, your um, process for consensus? You know, do you need, it, it's kind of like operating a, a board in some ways. You know, how many, how many people do you need to vote on and make a decision for that collaborative to move forward? Um, and, and plan for those issues and, and put them in writing. Um, I think you can go down as detailed as to say, you know, we're going to respond to each other within 48 business hours when we need to communicate. Or if a decision needs to be made, we're going to meet, you know, in this place um, at this time on this regular schedule. Um, and I think just having all of that in writing is so, so important. As a funder, when we see a collaborative that's doing those things, that's definitely a clue to us that they've thought through um, all the potential scenarios. Um, I would say also plan for decrease and in, increase in resources. Um, sometimes collaboratives can go uh, off track because one of the partners suddenly has an influx of funding that's unrelated to the partnership. And then on the flip side, they might have a decrease in funding that's affecting you know, their overall staff operations. And so I think you need to have those tough conversations and do some forward planning in terms of your financial resources and being really honest with each other's organizations um, about what some of those potential hiccups could be. And then my final tip would be make sure that your board of directors um, or whatever decision making body that you have is on board with the collaborative partnership and are involved in those decisions. Um, because that could definitely, you know, cause some cause some trouble down the road if your board isn't well informed of, of the partnership and, and why you're pursuing it. All right, thank you, Edie. So you said um, something really important uh, when planning, you need to plan for things to go wrong. And um, Jan, we would like you to answer, what, what are some common mistakes you see in grant applications? What happens when people don't plan for what goes wrong? What happens in those grant applications? Okay, so this takes us um, from collaborations and partnerships to grant writing um, and you know working the grant process. Um, and you know when it comes to uh, writing grants to a funder, there's so many different types of funding, which the three of us, um, Edie, Michael, and I, all represent very different um, organizations. Um, and so it's very important to know who it is that you're writing to, how well do does your mission does your mission align with their mission? Um, in in essence, know who your audience is. But to drive that a little bit deeper, be real careful in using jargon because language that you use in, in your everyday life may not be their language because they don't uh, function in that same arena. So you know, just be real careful with that. Um, one example, just this past uh, grant cycle, an organization had 
used multiple times in a grant application that um, their the clients had were person having agency. And it took us a little while to um, to find out what it was in particular that they were trying to communicate. Um, so just know that um, the jargon language that you use on a daily basis may not be um, familiar with others. Um, be very, very careful in following the instructions on a grant application. <clears throat> um, all the way down to making sure that attachments that are required um, are what they're looking for. And do know that if financial statements are required, um, there may be a listing of particular types of reports that are um, being asked for. If you don't have that, just try your best to create that, but also be in communication with that funder to see what is acceptable um, to them. Because if, you, if all that you can supply is um, uh, bank statements, that may knock you out, but it would be better to know that ahead of time by communicating with that funder than to go through the process and have your application kicked out. Um, think about your, uh, your grant as something that you will need in the long term not an immediate need. Not often do funders um, who have regular grant cycles, are they able to turn around grant applications quickly? There may be times in disaster emergency or things of the sort where they are turning around requests quickly, but for, for traditional regular grant making, there's a process to it and it's a timely process. So if you're making a request today, it may take two months or maybe even longer to get that response. And so make sure that you are um, allowing time for that. If you need it Im immediately, that may not be your best source. Always have a plan B um, and um, be able to adjust your, uh, your, your plan um, as in if you're only awarded a portion of what you're asked, that funder may be holding you to um, being able to accomplish all that you have set out with only a portion of their funding, which in essence, you'll need to do uh, fundraising to raise the, the remaining funds in order to, um, you know, to implement your program to full fru fruition. Um, collecting data now before you start to, um, to write a grant is very important, especially if you're a new organization and you do have access to information that helps to um, better explain, tell the story of what you do and how you do it. Um, demographics on the people that you serve. Um, uh, let's see, the, the demographics, but that's the people, what their situations are but also what are some of the things that you have done in the community? How can you um, create a, a historical uh, picture as to what you have been able to do out in the community that helps to show that um, even though you may not have uh, implemented your program for years, you can show that you have done some work in the, um, in the community and you do have a little bit of history, though it may not be formal history. Um, that all of this information gathering, being able to tell the story helps you to answer all, most of the questions in your grant application. Um, be able to explain where the funding uh, that you're receiving from this particular funding is, uh, is going to, and also make sure that when you receive the funding, that that is where it is going. Um, and if, if you're pooling funding um, and one funder is paying for this and another funder is paying for that, you might create a spreadsheet that shows the, the, uh, the funder what in particular on your program budget they're, they're funding. 
that's very helpful to them. They better understand uh, where your needs are and where they fit in your total project budget. Um, I will stop there. I think that you know I've hit on just some of the different um, areas that I would you know bring attention to, but I know that Edie and Michael can speak just as long on this with other ideas that would be very very helpful. So you know I'll open it up to you to you guys and you know please add on because I know that you all have just as much experience and knowledge at this than I do. So Dan, I think you, you uh, mentioned something of when you were talking about attachments that kind of caught my attention. So um, I think a common mistake is that organizations assume that exceptions can't be made, and not every organization, but there are often times, um, depending on what the requirement is that you can't meet, or maybe there's um, your calendar year doesn't align to our fiscal year. I think it's just a good lesson to be in communication about your application. Because if there is some type of exception that can be made, you won't know until you ask. Um, and so the organizations that are pushy and getting out ahead and they're asking those questions are the ones that end up succeeding. Because you never know when it might be um, a situation when we say, actually, yeah, you know, that that is allowable. Or let us talk to our board about it. We can make this work. Um, and so by assuming, you know, sometimes you don't don't come out ahead. Yeah, the couple things I would add, I mean, one, uh, I think there's a mistake that people make of assuming grants equal funding, like they think of this as like, I need grants to run my organization. Uh, at least in the Baton Rouge area, uh, grants are probably one fourth, one fifth of the amount of money that tends to flow into philanthropy, at least in the traditional sense of finding something that has the name foundation in it and writing a grant to apply for. Uh, there's individual donors, there's corporate donors, there's corporate sponsorships, there's, you know, a variety of events and a variety of other ways to raise money. So I, th I think one mistake is sort of building your model based off of I need to write grants and that sort of thing, you need a diversified funding base to really create a stable organization. I, I think two is not understanding that grants are a communication mechanism um, and communication mechanisms work best when they dovetail with other communication you're having. And so, you know, to the degree that what's in a grant is something fundamentally different than what anybody knows about your organization, probably not going to go well uh, to the degree that the grant is the first time you're communicating with an organization probably not going to go well. Uh, and so I think just knowing that uh, that it is one of many modes to communicate what you want and what you need. Um, and then I just think there's basic like proofreading and follow up, like the amount of times I see like substantively meaningful typos, like moving decimal points multiple places or putting the wrong name in or not putting the name in. Um, you know, people need to figure out who to call to ask a question or do you really need a million or was that a thousand? Um, you know, those things happen a lot. Uh, and then they lead to lots of related follow up questions. So, you know, if you're going to use it as a communication mechanism, make sure you're communicating what you want. Those are um, great tips. Uh, I appreciate that um, and would like to know. So, you know, when you are looking at grants and you're listening to the mistakes, uh, often organizations look at other grants to see who's been successful. Um, um, Michael, can you speak to like some elements of great grant applications? Yeah, be happy to. So, I mean, Jan touched on a lot of this in, in her answer. I mean, in, in so many ways, a great grant application is a clearly articulated uh, explanation of who you are, what is the problem you're attempting to solve, why you need funding to solve it, and what the results will look like over the stated time frame. I mean, it's, it's a clear, succinct, easily understandable argument that then technically meets all the other requirements that are being asked for. Um, and, you know, and I think at least from uh, to, to Jan's point earlier, I mean, foundations are different, entities are different, so you need to know the audience you're appealing to. For us, we wind up saying some of the things that, that people often don't think about in articulating a grant application, you know, we really want to have very clear outcomes. So our board, and this is true for I think many, is going to say, if we fund this, what will be different or what will be true. And frequently we get broad generalities, you know, kids will get better service. 
what in the heck does that mean? Um, are we talking more kids? Are we talking the kids will be better served? If better served, what does that mean? Be very clear in concrete ways that somebody who doesn't know what you do can understand um, and can feel compelled by. So I think that matters. I think being very clear about who's in charge in what way. Um, we talked about collaboratives earlier. Collaboratives are wonderful, but one of the pitfalls of collaboratives is you have a committee that runs things. Committees don't run things well. Um, people run things well. And so when push comes to shove, who decides? Um, and knowing that and articulating that in a way that is compelling to a funder, uh, I think it is, uh, is powerful. Um, and then, you know, I think it is also important to the thing that I said earlier of being able to articulate how you aren't solely reliant upon this grant to get something done. Um, one of the biggest uh, turnoffs for us, uh, and we see this regularly, is when folks will say, here's a great idea we have and something we want to do, but we're entirely reliant upon this grant fund to do it. And, and I think our board will say, even if it is a great idea, we're not going to do it. And the reason being, clearly, you don't care all that much because you're not pursuing multiple other avenues to get this done. Um, and whether that's other grants, other funders, other partners, if you think it's important for your organization, go after it. Uh, and we can certainly be a part of that. It's much more compelling for a funder, for a grant writer to, to see that other people are going to, I think, uh, that you're committed to getting the work done and that others are going to engage alongside, as opposed to just reliant upon one entity to fund you. And then I, I think that inherently has the pitfall of when the funding ends, maybe the work ends. So I think many grantors want to, to understand uh, that there's going to be a commitment to that work. Um, so there's lots of other nuance. The only other thing I guess I would say while I'm talking is, you know, to the examples used earlier uh, of how these collaboratives and great grants work, we did a, a partner convening for folks across the state a, a couple of weeks back now. And uh, Youth City Lab, a uh, group that I'm sure is known to quite a few folks on the call, um, actually did an, about an hour discussion of how they work their back end. So how do they do meetings? How do they discuss and work through challenges? And they went into a fair amount of detail. That's all videotaped and up on our website. So if folks are thinking about collaboratives and want to understand how others are doing it, um, they went into a lot of the nitty gritty and that may be helpful to watch. That's great information. Um... Um, Edie or Jan, especially Edie, I, I know um, Jan touched on it and Michael um, elaborated. Is there anything you wanted to add as far as like grant, uh, great grant applications or was everything covered that you were thinking as well? <laughs> bell check, bell check, bell check. Great, great, great. Well, let's move on. Um, Edie, what are some misconceptions about grant writing and like being awarded grants? And I think Michael actually touched on some of this already, but um, can you elaborate on that? He did. He took a, he took a couple of my points I've written down, which is great. Um, okay, so I think number one is not presenting the challenges that your organization is experiencing. I think sometimes there's this assumption that a funder only wants to hear the positives which is true. Of course, we want to know what your organization is doing really well and the successes that you've had. Um, but you can really tell a great story about growth when you've talked through recent challenges that your organization has experienced and how you overcame them. I think it's also just speaks to the maturity of your organization when you can predict challenges that will come up in the um, grant cycle that you are applying for. So you can say, you know, we're applying for these funds for this specific program or this specific project. We anticipate that this type of event may happen. And here's how we plan to overcome it using your dollars. Um, I always find that to be just extremely, extremely compelling. Um, speaking of being compelling, um, I think there's this misconception um, that you have to paint a very flowery story to talk about your organization. Um, and that's just not true. You can be, you can be concise. You can use data. You can tell a really great story without maximizing your word count. Um, I think you can also tell a really great story, um, by, by not using massive vocabulary. I think sometimes we get this, we get these great applications and it almost reads like a college student working on their thesis. And it's great, it's, it's a pleasure to read, um, but it 
it's really difficult when you're the funder and you're reading through hundreds of applications and hundreds of pages of documents when an organization can't just get right to the point. So, um, you know, we appreciate the pretty writing, <laughs> at least I do, um, love to read it, but not in the context of having to make a lot of decisions really quickly. Um, and then just so one other, not to contradict the point that Michael made, but I think when you're talking about funds coming in, sometimes organizations um, will maybe overestimate the amount of funds that they anticipate coming in. And so it's hard to get a good handle on what the need actually is. Um, so at the one at the one end, you don't want to be, you know, relying on the one funder. But on the other end, when you see um, an organization predicting that their income for a program is so high because they've applied across, they've applied for every grant available in the community. Um, it's hard to really understand what the true need is from my organization to make your project happen. Um, and so I know there's not a, you know, a great answer for that. Grants are competitive. You need to apply for a lot of them, um, but, but be selective. Um, there's no way that you can have that deep of a relationship with every funder for every single application. So, you know, be selective and, and make those relationships really meaningful um, because that funder is going to remember, you know, the need that you're presenting on and off paper for that relationship. Great information, um, Edie. This last question um, that I have is actually for all of you and we'll go in order of Michael, Jan, and Edie. Um, you've given several examples today and a lot of good information, but um, I'd like you to give examples of opportunities for nonprofit and for-profit organizations to collaborate and share resources, including funding. We do have members that are for-profit and um, nonprofit. And so I think it would be really beneficial um, if they had some examples of those types of opportunities. Michael, can you answer that first? Yeah, I'd be happy to. So uh, I'll say there's two that are just uh, very apparent. So one uh, is in, in the contracting dynamic. There are certain things that for-profits do better than nonprofits and vice versa. And it kind of depends exactly what we're talking about. Um, there are very few nonprofit software vendors that do the back end of what we all do on a daily basis from accounting to whatever else. Um, you know, nonprofits have contracts with lots of for-profits on a regular basis, it, simply expanding that set of thoughts to understand who in the for-profit world or who in the business world does something we need done. Is there a way that we can get discounted services? Is there a way that we can collaborate? Um, I think sort of thinking all the way through the, the business model of your organization and identifying the points that you're either uh, paying for services, getting donated services today, and then leveraging that opportunity, I, I think is a just thoughtful way to go. And, and frankly, the for-profits frequently want opportunities to engage with uh, business partners that uh, that that align to them. So we we do a fair amount of work, for example, in skills based volunteering, uh, helping our people leverage their accounting background or communications background to help nonprofits. Well, they're a accountant as their job, but what they are then doing with the nonprofit is a way to donate their services and their time and their insights. So I think that's one bucket. Um, the other I would say is we're living in a really unique time where there is an absurd amount of money available for nonprofits, for for-profits and for others that are currently sitting with schools, with uh, parishes, with universities, uh, with state government, uh, and much of that is still unallocated. Uh, there are needs that a local government has that are not being met. Uh, and in some ways, those local governments are waiting for someone to show up and say, hey, here's how we can address the fact that kids are dramatically further behind academically than they were you know, two years ago. So here's what high dosage tutoring will really look like in practice. Or here's how we can help you with future pandemic needs in addressing healthcare services, or you fill in the blank. Um, there's money on the table courtesy of COVID relief dollars. And frequently that's gonna require collaborations that are larger than any one nonprofit can handle on their own. Thank you, Michael. Jan? Yeah, so Michael, you covered quite a few, but uh, let me add to, um, to some of what you had um, have given. Um, as you had started out with, um, there are so many uh, private sector organizations, businesses 
that have expertise that an organization can partner with, which is is huge in the impact that, that an organization can have by partnering with a, a private sector um, business. Uh, the funding, like in um, from our perspective, the funding from us goes to the nonprofit, but from there it can flow through to any type of agency that helps that organization do whatever it is that they're they're doing or their need is. Um, and so do recognize that the money doesn't stay specifically with the, the nonprofit. There, um, as Michael had said, uh, with Blue Cross, they have the ability to, um, to have their staff um, volunteer out in the community in order to take advantage, um, organizations can take advantage of the expertise that Blue Cross has. And because of, they are such a huge organization, there's multiple levels of expertise that they have. So that is a great, great opportunity, but Blue Cross isn't the only um, organization that ha has that type of need to get their um, staff out. Many um, uh, law firms, many banks have the same type of need to get their, uh, their staff out into the community. So um, reach out, communicate, because it is, all about communicating. Um, communicate with those sources that have potential that you maybe you have heard out in the community of their uh, helping out, uh, one business maybe helping out with um, uh, um, fundraising or with media or something of that sort. Reach out to them. If, it, if that is one of your needs, reach out and see if they would help out, help your organization out also. Um, as Michael was talking about, there are agencies with, um, with funding that they still have, especially government agencies, but many, um, many funders, as you get to the end of the year, they may have a few dollars at the end of their fiscal year that they still need to get out. So if you have an established relationship with an entity, Check in with them if you know, you know when their fiscal year is, if it's not a calendar year. Check in with them. See if they have uh, additional funds for a small need that you might have. Maybe it's a big need. Maybe they have a lot of funds at the end of the year that they need to give out. So, you know, um, communicate, communicate. And, oh, did I say communicate? <laughs> yeah. Just staying in contact with your, uh, with your donors, it really is of great benefit to you. So Edie, do you want to add anything? Sure, I have just a couple of quick points. Um, so both of you mentioned those connections to for profits. Um, one thing I have learned because at United Way we work with lots of corporations um, to to fundraise our dollars to get back out into the community. But I've learned that there are so many networking and professional service groups um, for each type of industry, and many times those groups have their own agendas for engagement and volunteerism. Uh, I'm thinking of the Baton Rouge Bar Association. There's a local HR professionals group. Um, there's a local accounting group that have come and sent, you know, dozens of volunteer income tax preparers to our program. Um, and so I would look at what some of the gaps are that you're trying to fill in your organization and find some of these professional service groups. It's just a great way to connect. Oftentimes, and y'all know this, when you um, are engaging someone with their time, dollars may follow. And so it's a way to, you know, build your individual donor pipeline, and hopefully a major gifts pipeline. Um, and then to take a, a different turn on this question, um, the past couple of years, the Walls Project and Metromorphosis have come together for something called One Rouge. And they are building out a community of coalitions around the nine drivers of poverty. But every Friday morning at 8 a.m., they meet and it's, a, um, it's just a conglomerate of nonprofits, issue-based experts, for-profits, um, community members that are, are coming together for the common good um, and recognizing that these nine drivers of poverty are what's you know, making things uh, more challenging in our community. And so every, every Friday they come together around a specific topic. Um, this started you know, right at the outset of COVID and I have watched so many organizations come together organically um, that did not know that each other existed or an individual has connected with an organization um, in a very meaningful way um, and some big outcomes have come out of that. So if you are not connected in with One Rouge, um, I definitely encourage you to do so and 
Jasmine, we can make sure that the, the sign up for that goes out with the meeting follow up. Absolutely. Absolutely. Well, this, um, thank you so much for uh, answering all of our questions today. I'm sure after this recording is sent out, um, there will be many more questions coming from the membership. Uh, Brain is working to uh, build this collaboration. As stated earlier, one of our principles of practice is collaboration and uh, collaborative funding is um, on the rise. Uh, we know collaborative partnerships has, you know, been something that's been around for um, a while. I think uh, the insight that you've given today will definitely help our members strengthen their organizations and, you know, collaborate a lot more strategically and effectively. So we appreciate um, your time today. I saw that Edie and I think Jan put their information in the chat. Michael, did you as well? I did. Okay. All right. Well, thank you. Um, thank you all for being here. We really, really appreciate it. Um, members, please reach out to them if you have any additional questions. And if you reach out to me, I'll make sure to get that information to them. Thank you all for being here. Thank you. And Michael, especially, thank you, thank you very much for uh, joining us um, uh, and giving your insights. Definitely appreciate it. Happy to do it. Absolutely. Thank you both. Thank, well, thank you, you all. all. All right, members, at this time, I'm going to go ahead and give the brain announcements. We have... Um, this convening was so great and we wanna know what's important to you and what you would like to, um, what you would like us to talk about, what's important to your organization. So the convening working group has created a convening topic poll um, that will be shared via email. And if you can just get that back to us and let us know what uh, information you would like us to share um, and I'm sorry, what convening topics you would like us to uh, research and what you would like to learn about, we would definitely appreciate that. Um, the next brain convening is July 15th from 10 a.m. to 1130, so save the date for that. Uh, last month, we talked about Brett celebrating their 75th birthday celebration at Independence Community Park. It is on July 16th from 6 p.m. to until 8.30 p.m. Uh, Breck is one of our partners, so we definitely want to uh, celebrate with them. So if you're able to uh, go out and celebrate with them, please do so. Um, last month, we also talked about e the East Baton Rouge Parish School System Back to School Bash. Uh, Brain will have a table at that back to school bash. Last month, I shared a link, um, which was um, a brain link. So I do have information on uh, organizations that are willing to participate. Since then, I have had a meeting with EBR and was supplied a vendor link that they would like us all to fill out separately. So if you use the link that I shared last month, um, if you will use the link that I'm going to share via email this month, um, that will go straight to EBR and they will follow up with additional information. Again, that back to school bash is at the Raisin Canes River Center, August 6th from 11 a.m. until 3 p.m. And more information will be available next month uh, via EBR communications. Thank you all so much. Um, we hope you have a great weekend and we hope that your celebration of Juneteenth is fruitful in building the community. Have a great weekend.